So it, as an introduction, you know, we all know how important a temperation is. And to echo what Bob said earlier, it's been a, a big issue for us um, and our fleet of, of HRSGs as far as causing issues and damage. It seems like a lot of times we neglect um, maintenance of these block valves and also the temperature control valves. So they didn't, due to the severe service and the high number of cycles these um, this equipment goes through, it does uh, develop wear and eventually leak by that can put you know relatively cool water into a hot steam pipe when you don't want it to be there so as you can imagine that doesn't bode well for the piping for the, um, the internal liner for the welds um, and other you know hrsg pressure parts if it can migrate downstream to the to the tubes and the headers and some of those welded connections as well so we all we all kind of know how the temperation works. Uh, you're trying to control your steam temperature both on the high pressure and the hot reheat side, and maintain that constant temperature going to the steam turbine. Because we all know the steam turbine uh, likes a constant temperature. It doesn't do well as far as um, a lot of fluctuations. So um, and the tolerant, you know, the blade tolerances are pretty tight. So you want to kind of keep things consistent going to the steam turbine. And we do that um, by taking uh, condensate from the boiler feed pumps and, and inject, injecting it. And you know, there's different types of attemperators. Our primary type, of course, is the um, is a ring style. We have a lot of CCI and a lot of Fisher equipment on our unit, so they're the ring style with the um, spring uh, loaded nozzles. And you, you'll tip anywhere from three to five to six um, spray nozzles circumferentially around the steam pipe. And then you have to, of course, have to have a long distance downstream in order to evaporate that uh, that spray that spray flow. And so our typical configuration is similar to what you see in this drawing, where there's a um, temperature control valve and then a block valve upstream. And we know how critical it is that a temperature works properly. Um, you know that you don't overspray to saturation. And then, of course, the other big piece of that is that you don't get any leak by plus past that block valve because uh, that can cause significant amount of damage and thermal quenching okay so a little bit of, of background to add to that is that you know due to these issues that we're starting to see in our fleet we've had to, and i'll show you a few photos in the next couple of slides but we've had to do quite a bit of replacement projects for temperators you know we'll do bore scopes every two years and test the nozzles. And then of course we're doing HEP inspections, you know, maybe every four or five years to look at downstream elbows and welded connections for any kind of crack indications and doing a lot of NDE on those. You know, we want to keep our, our plants as safe as possible, uh, protect uh, you know, everyone at the plant that, because a lot of these piping systems are out in, in locations that we're doing operator rounds and doing other work activities. So this is very important uh, piece of, of our um, inspection program to maintain integrity of this equipment. Um, however, you know, we have found issues throughout our fleet, like Bob mentioned, you know, um, with liners, cracking liners. So that becomes a concern that they could further crack and break apart and then send some pieces and parts downstream and cause damage. And then anytime you have any issues with, with cracks and potential for um, for integrity of your of your steam pipe, that's a, a huge concern, huge uh, safety issue. So we we take immediate action to address those types of issues. And as you can imagine, it gets very expensive to replace these large um, pressure parts. The lead times can off if you're replacing a whole attemperator, the lead times can be fairly long to get a new one you know manufactured. Um, so for the spray flow, the typical flow meter is just a you know your standard orifice dp style flow meter um, like you see in this drawing to measure uh, how much spray flow is going to your temperator and in this case you had two channels coming off of that um of that indicator some in some cases we just have um you know one flow transmitter in other cases there's two you know flow transmitter channels for redundancy uh, it's from what I found, it's a bit difficult to determine when that block valve is degraded and when it's leaking by. So it was a bit of a guessing game. And um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we're not 
performing the maintenance as, as often as we should to ensure a good tight shut off of that block valve. Um, you know, we can look at other indications other than the flow meter. You know, you have your, your thermocouples upstream and downstream. Um, so a lot of times just looking at those can be a, a good indication. You have some leak by if the leak by severe enough, it'll start to show up on your downstream thermocouple. But what I found was during startups and shutdowns, you have a larger DP across that block valve because you're looking at maybe 3000 pounds or, or more coming from your boiler feed pump. And during a startup and shutdown, your pressures on your steam side are going to be much uh, lower. So that DP across the valve increases. So you're going to, uh, your leak by rates will, will therefore increase. And so um, during startups and shutdowns, I found it was more difficult to detect that leak by. So we, we have evaluated using some acoustical style um, systems to start to determine leak by on the block valve. Um, however, with the current technology, it only gives a noise signature, not a, not a flow rate. So I didn't. So far, we we hadn't found that to be as good of a solution as as the ultrasonics. So here's a couple of the photos I had mentioned of of damage when we do our internal bore scope. So this is a this is not a steam pipe. It is the liner just downstream of the spray nozzles, but some significant cracking and and generally, well, it's. It's just immediately downstream of those spray nozzles because you can imagine this water kind of dribbling in instead of having a nice spray pattern uh, that can evaporate quickly. You don't have that steam flow that's necessary. And I think it's really the steam velocity. I'm not an expert on the temperators, but I think it's the steam velocity that kind of helps um, mix that incoming spray flow and evaporate it. But when you don't have that during startup and shutdown or a low load condition, this is what what happens because you think about that water just kind of dribbling in and making contact with this very hot um, steam pipe and liner, and it can it can cause um, those quenches that develops you know develops the stress that turns into cracks here pretty quickly. Uh, a couple more photos um, from um, from the liners as well. H this is an HP attemperator. So additional cracks that were um, found in, a, in another unit. And this was uh, really concerning. This was an older unit that had been in operation for almost 20 years. And this is a hot reheated temperator. And this is the weld immediately downstream um, of the liner. So the first weld after the internal liner, um, you know, act actual steam pipe weld. And we found a crack that was this is a one inch thick P22 pipe and the crack was um, three quarters of the way through the wall of the pipe. It was into the base metal of the pipe. So we ended up having to cut out that entire section of pipe and replace it due to concerns with, you know, being able to do an adequate uh, weld repair. So that was a um, pretty significant finding at that unit. And especially given the depth of the crack and you can see that all this micro cracking that had developed in the base metal as well. These were not as deep, but um, significant de degradation. And, and we do believe that, you know, not only was it overspray that contributed to that, but also this, this leak by was, was also either a primary or um, secondary contributing factor to some of this, this damage that we're seeing. So. Uh, so this photo to the in the upper right is not one of our units, but um, I think I found this in some of the EPRI literature. Um, and that was a really significant uh, cracking going on there. We haven't seen it that bad. A lot of these cracks are, are much smaller, um, but you can see the same thing. F a few other examples there of um, internal uh, temperator liner damage. So yeah, I'd already mentioned that we we believe the um, leak by to be a uh, primary root cause and having to replace these um, steam pipe sections gets very expensive. I think there was a recent outage that we had where it, it, we were gonna have to replace both elbows in, in two of our units because of um, cracking that was found and it was gonna be you know over $500,000 in O&M cost and, and in, during an a planned outage. Um, so luckily it didn't cause any additional offline time, but still it's a lot of uh, 
you know, a lot of money and a lot of time to, to go after those sorts of repairs. So the, the solution that, um, that we found to help determine when these block valves are starting to degrade, uh, we initially reached out to Bob Anderson and EPRI to see if they had any recommendations. Like I said, we evaluated some, some of the acoustical type of detection. You know, we were trying to use it at existing instrumentation. Um, so we're looking for something different that would be you know, very accurate. It would be easy to install um, and it would be good at those low flow conditions. So that's when we, we heard about these uh, Flexum ultrasonic flow meters. And uh, Bob actually had one that he loaned us to do some field trials on. It's an F601 uh, model. And of course, you know, um, ultrasonic flow meter, it mounts directly to the exterior of the pipe. So there's no welding required. You're not disturbing that pressure part. Very easy to install. We were able to do this without any additional um, assistance from, you know, the maintenance team. We just removed um, a small section of, of ins insulation, as you can see in these photos, and we're able to, to clamp the transducers directly to the pipe. So there's, uh, you know, there's two transducers and it sends a signal um, through the, the pipe full of liquid. And one of the, the, the sensor that's downstream captures the signal and then it all depends on the movement of that signal. So it, it calculates a Delta T and I'm sure there's probably some folks on the call from, from Flexum that could go into a lot more detail about how this works and um, kind of the science behind it. But that's some of the basics, as you can see in, in this slide, that we're cal calculating a volumetric flow rate. And it kind of goes through the science of the calculation. And I um, thought I would just, just read this because it was goes into some good detail. So the transducers are mounted on the pipe, which is completely filled with the fluid. The ultrasonic signals are admitted alternatively by a transducer and received by the other. And the physical quantities are determined from the transient time of the ultrasonic signals. And as the fluid where the ultrasonic propagates is flowing, the transit time of the ultrasonic signal and flow direction is shorter than the one against the, the flow direction. So the transit time difference or the delta T is measured and allows the flow meter to determine the average flow velocity along the propagation path of the ultrasonic signals. And then a flow profile correction is then performed in order to obtain the area averaged flow velocity, which is proportional to the volumetric flow rate. And the integrated microprocessor controls the entire measuring cycle. Um, the received ultrasonic signals are checked for measurement, usability, and evaluated for their reliability, and the noise, noise signals are eliminated. So that's kind of the, the basic principle behind how it works. And some of the advantages, and, and I found this, so this is from Flexum, but I found it to be true just through our experience and through our field trials. Um, so it's you know non non invasive as I was saying it it mounts directly to the exterior of the pipe, um, you know they're very reliable. Um, no maintenance is required, which I I found to be good because we're we're already fairly uh, short staffed at our plant, so we didn't we wanted to find a solution that didn't add a a lot of additional time and um, you know annual calibrations and things like that. Um, they claim that they're nearly indestructible. You know, there's no pressure drop compared to a DP uh, orifice. You're going you're to get some wear and, and you're going to have to calibrate the instrument as it degrades over time, but you don't have that pressure drop internally um, from the flow. So bi-directional, it can measure flow in either direction. And, uh, you know, Flexum says that there's no drift on these instruments. They're already zeroed. And I, I did find this to be true, this, this section about the um, support. They were very helpful. I could call as we were um, installing our permanent um, flow meters. I would call the um, uh, tech rep and he would always answer right away or send me a, a message and said he would get back to me. And he, they helped us through a few um, issues and questions we had when we were doing our initial setup on our first units for the, for the permanent system. 
a couple other um, advantages to, to this type of, of uh, system. So I think one of the big advantages that I've noticed is how good they are at, um, at low flows, because that's really the main thing we're looking for is trying to evaluate these block valves for degradation. So we want to see a very um, uh, you know, low flow signal and watch how, how it degrades over time. So, yeah, so it says extremely low flow rates with a high, high turn down ratio. And we kind of went through the way these are installed already. Um, so what we did in, in our application was, you know, each pipe, um, the HP and the hot reheat, they were close enough together that each um, spray line had its own set of transducers. And then both of those transducers fed back to a single flow transmitter. So there was two channels. So the HP was the alpha channel and the hot reheat was the um, Bravo channel. And it could take the input from both. And then from there, it would send out a signal to the DCS, a four to 20 milliamp signal that was continuously read from both of these channels in the single um, flow transmitter. And what we ended up doing for the permanent installation was um, just reusing one of the existing um, flow transmitter signals. Okay. But yeah, this kind of shows some of the different configurations you can use. And we did the two transducers on one side of the pipe with um, what they call a permalock mounting system. And so then the, the signal would, would bounce off the opposite side of the pipe and then get intercepted by the um, transducer on the same side. But you can also, you know, put them opposite, like it shows here, to where it's sending one signal across. Um, so these are just some of the different ways you you can mount the um, transducers, and you know, really a wide range of um, fluids uh, can be measured, and a lot of different, um, you know, flow ranges and also temperatures. So very versatile is what I found. This is another another photo of um, the transducer setup, and it does have an embedded um, RTD that they can use for the the transducer um, calibration. Okay. And this was a photo of the portable meter we use for testing. Um, so for the test, we we went to three or four different sites and tried it out on on different configurations and you know different types of attemperators different units um, so we wanted to compare the data that we gathered using this um, ultrasonic flow meter to the dp transmitter and also we did a mass balance using operational data and epri helped us out with that they developed a nice um, you know worksheet uh, using excel to where we could just plug in the, the data and it would spit out our um, calculated uh, you know flow of, of, of a temperator spray water. Okay, so this, this photo shows where we installed those um, at the first plant was, was HF Lee, which is um, three on one combined cycle. And so when you program these things, you're putting in all these variables that will affect the signal that the transducer sends. You're putting in your pipe material, your pipe diameter, wall thickness, and your internal um, temperatures. So all that has to be programmed in. And for us, our HP spray line was three inch schedule 160 and the reheat spray line was three inch schedule 80. And the temperatures ran somewhere around 300 to 350 degrees because it's, you know, it's coming from the boiler feed pump. So this talks a little bit about the history of the plant where we found a lot of that cracking that you saw in the previous slides. And all three of those HP attemperators, we've had to replace them because of um, because of cracking in those internal liners. And so, yeah, the HP attemperator spray block valve that is believed to be the root cause of the cracking. All the um, the block valves had never been replaced since commissioning, uh, so they had gone for you know roughly eight or nine years before we did we did finally replace them after we started suspecting the the leak valve was going on. And of course, you know, I mentioned earlier when we do our cold 
steam turbine startups, that leads to a lot of a temperator overspray as well. But it's interesting because we have a, a sister site to these units where we haven't had the, the cracking issue. And um, as far as I know, that, that site has done more maintenance on their block valve. So it really does, in my opinion, it keys in to, the, to this being a root cause of a lot of that, that cracking that we're seeing. Okay. Uh, so this was some of the initial data that we gathered. And this unit operates at an extreme low load. At, um, at some point, so you can see the calculated spray flow, the mass balance, um, and that matches up very nicely with the flexum data we were gathering, and then the, the DP from the, um, from the DCS, so that or orifice DP, DP was way off at certain times. Sometimes it matched pretty well, at other times it was, it was way off. I wanted to key in on this low load period, like I mentioned earlier, you know, when that DP across the block valve is higher and we saw increased leak by um, that that was validated with the the data here so you can see both the flexum and the flow meter um, flow increased during that low load period when you had um, the, the less uh, dp so that kind of validated some of those theories we had about um, when the, the leak by was at its worst and that kind of makes things even any even more damaging because that's when your, your steam flows are lower uh, so definitely not a good good situation there. Uh, just another set of um, data. This is zoomed in a little bit so you can see that same low load period and I filtered it with the block valve closed. So we did validate we were having some significant leak by, I think it was around 3000 pounds, pounds mass per hour. Um, and then of course that DP flow meter was um, was showing a little bit, but it was just not as accurate. The DP transmitter didn't seem nearly as accurate at the low flows. So this gave us a much better picture of what was going on. Um, so these were some of my, my observations on that the reheat side. Um, so we did confirm that leak by was happening and we had a plan in to go ahead and replace those block valves during the next uh, outage. And I think I've, I've kind of covered a lot of these, uh, these points already. And on the HP side, we saw some, some similar issues. The one complaint I had about the, the test meter we had, it would show negative values and we never really got a good resolution to why that was happening. So that's why you can see the, the flow reading kind of dips down to negative anytime the, um, block valve was closed. So on this, this unit in particular, I think this was after we replaced that block valve and it had good tight shutoff so that the value for the flexum would go to, go to negative. And we did, when we installed the permanent system, we added an RTD, which feeds the temperature of the, of the process flow back to the flexum flow meter. And since we're calculating a mass flow, it, it, you know, it adjusts for the density of the fluid. And uh, so we're seeing much um, better readings from the permanent installation. We didn't have that with our test setup, so that's why we suspect we were seeing these uh, these negative readings. Another look at the HP attemperator, and the same sort of process was followed. And once again, this was after the uh, this was after the block valve was replaced. So you can see the flexum flow meter goes to zero anytime that block valve is closed. And um, calculated spray water was a little bit off, but it matches matches pretty well. Just a you know, nice comparison between the DP uh, reading and the flex and flow meter reading. Mouse is not cooperating. It's weird. Try this instead. Sorry, something locked up on me. There it goes. Okay, so the HP observations, I you know I covered all those already with the um, uh, everything matching up nicely. 
and then it talks a little bit about the uh, negative values that we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, this was just another unit where we, we saw some similar results uh, of the calculated spray water values versus the flexum and the DP flow transmitters. In this case, that DP transmitter was way off of, um, of the other two values. So once again, that just kind of helped us validate uh, how well these were working. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention, we were doing this test, uh, we had one unit on the HP spray line that was reading about 110 uh, pounds mass per hour. So not a huge amount of leak by, but it was, you know, it was a little bit. And so we had at, there was a manual valve downstream. So we asked the operators to come in and close that manual valve just to see what the, how the flexum flow meter responded. And when the and when the operator closed the manual valve, so the block the temperature control valve was closed, the block valve was closed, but we were getting the um, 110 pounds mass per hour. As soon as the operator closed that manual block valve, we saw the the indication drop off on the flexum flow meter down to um, you know right at zero or maybe a little bit negative. So that was um, kind of reassuring that this thing was was reading accurately and responding. Um, so we've got our first permanent installation now at that three on one unit that had the, uh, the temperator damaged. And as I mentioned earlier, we just selected one of those uh, DP indication, indication, the flow transmitters and replaced it with the flex and ultrasonic flow meter. So it's a, it's a good comparison between the DP and the, um, and the flex. Um, some of our units only have one flow meter. So we had to make a decision. Do we, reuse the existing flow transmitter so we can reuse the wiring and not have to run new wiring and conduit and put a new card in, or do we add a redundant? So one would be DP and one would be Flexum. And uh, some of our some of our sites have chose to, to add a redundant and others have, have chose um, to replace it altogether. And uh, as far as um, sending the signal back to the DCS, we've been using a four to 20 milliamp signal. I think there's, you know, there's other options for what you can do. You can use heart and, <laughs> um, and, and quite a few other options there. I think there's, there's binary output, frequency output and active or passive. We chose to, to use a passive um, output because our, and our other instrumentation, the DCS powers the loop. So we chose to stay consistent with that. So that's kind of getting into the de details of, of the permanent installation. Okay, um, I do wanna caution that for in our case, the uh, temperator spray flow does feed into the drum level logic. It's a very small part of it, but it's part of that total you know, mass flow of steam flow. Um, so it does have a small piece. So any, any changes you do make, you wanna check and make sure it doesn't have an impact to the control logic um, once you make that initial swap over. So that's something we were aware of and, and kind of looked into. It's just a couple of photos of that um, initial installation. Uh, you can see the, the flow transmitter itself in the enclosure and the, um, the transducers, that's the permalock system where it mounts onto the pipe. Uh, very easy to, to navigate and to program these things and to set them up. So I was real, real pleased with them. Um, you know, the, the ease of use of navigating through the menus and you can even send a test signal out to the DCS um, just to, to verify the integrity of the circuit. So this, this talks a little bit about how you can do a, um, a field or a bench setup uh, using a USB connection to a laptop and, and they have special software called Flux Diag or Diag that you can um, use to, to get these things configured. It's very easy to use. I used the um, software when we were doing the field trial to gather the data, because at that point we weren't sending the information to the DCS for monitoring. Um, and you know, all this information that was directly from, uh, from Flexum. And I already mentioned a little bit about the, the outputs, about the communications. So the flow meter itself, it can be either you know, DC or AC powered, I think we, set ours up to be AC powered. So it does have a local 
power supply for the flow transmitter itself. But then, as I mentioned earlier, it's passive um, powered. So the DCS actually powers the output from the, the flow transmitter. And, you, and we ended up using the four to 20 milliamp output to get our, um, our flow readings from the temperature spray line. Yeah, and you can do real-time diagnostics, so it goes into a little bit more details, and you know, Flexum could could explain this a lot better than I could. But um, yeah, real-time diagnostics. And this was the uh, the data once we got the permanent system installed over there at HF Lee on those three units. Um, you know, now we're reading that that information. I can log in anytime and and get the data and, and evaluate how our block valves are looking. So this is what an example of the of what the data looks like through Pi. Um, so since we have you know, replaced all these block valves recently, they're all still um, holding uh, nicely. No no leak by currently, so that's good. But you know, as soon as they start to degrade, we'll be able to pick on pick up on that very quickly. So you can see a lot of noise. That purple line is the DP um, flow transmitter. And the I should have made this a different color because it blends in, but this blue line is the um, Flexum flow meter. And you can compare them directly since they're on different channels. And uh, you know, anytime that block valve goes closed, you see the Flexum flow meter goes directly to zero, whereas the, the DP transmitters has got the noise and, and still shows a little bit of of flow there, so definitely not as accurate. Yeah, just another example. I think this was HP temperator spray water flow, but really the same thing that we observed there was the DP was a bit off and, and Flexum as soon as that block valve went closed and had good tight shut off, the you know Flexum flow meter dropped to, to zero and, and stayed there. So I've been real, real pleased with the performance of it so far and another example from the i think that's hp as well from another unit so some of the um, future potential and additional benefits that we see is that <clears throat> yeah we can now develop an optimal repair and replacement strategy for these um, block valves. And another thing we've been focusing on is, is the number of cycles, um, trying to reduce those using control logics. I know there's, there's a lot of different um, options for that and strategies you can take. You know, some people believe you could keep the block valve open the whole time and you might take a little bit of a hit on efficiency because those temperature control valves aren't the best for tight shutoff. Um, so we, the way we operate is, um, you know, we cycle the block valve when these units um, move and load and maybe they go duck fired. You don't have to temperate the entire time. So these block valves are cycling quite a bit, but we have taken some action to reduce the number of cycles, which should help. But having this, um, this flow indicator in place will just let us monitor. I mean, we can probably do some studies and compare the number of cycles to to how long it takes to to wear the seat of the valve, and then it'll give us a good repair strategy, time-based, um, that we need to, to replace. Or I guess it would be more performance-based since we um, are, are doing a lot more analytics on this. Uh, yeah, we can also um, you know, monitor the control valve in the system because it's will experience the same benefits where the flow through the valve at a given valve position may be trended over time to determine a wear rate. And we are looking at expanding this to bypass the temperators. Uh, we have had a few issues, you know, they don't operate quite as often in our fleet. We're not doing a ton of cycling, but those you know, bypass temperators, they can just, they can be just as detrimental if the block valve starts to leak by and you're getting um, you know, some quenching or maybe even some pulling of water that could, could develop when that thing um, opens and maybe you know potentially sends a slug of water downstream and um, we are i think I've, I've presented earlier through the hersic form about our steam atomizing of temperators that's something that's um, kind of new to the industry but we're moving forward with on several of our units you know any kind of leak by on that i 
think is is not a good thing. So this is really um, a high priority for us on any of those sites where we're adding the um, the steam atomizing attenuators. You definitely don't want won't leak by on those since there's no spray nozzles or and um, you may be putting water in without the atomizing steam. So that's going to uh, be a good benefit. But yeah, overall, I'm real real pleased with these. This is kind of a fleet standard that we're moving towards to install these on all our units in the Carolinas. We've got it on that one three-on-one uh, power block. Uh, we're, we're doing additional six units this fall, and um, we're going to move forward from there. Um, so a lot, a lot of good benefit, and we really appreciate Flexum and their support and helping us to um, get these things installed. And we appreciate Bob and EPRI for helping us to kind of vet these out to make sure that it would work well for this application. So I've been overall very pleased with the, the ease of installation, the performance, and the um, results we're getting from the, um, from the flex and flow meters. So with that, um, I'll give it back to Bob and, and moderate any questions we may have. So thank you for the opportunity to present. And, Thank you, Eugene. Um, Barry, Barry is going to handle the uh, question and answer portion. There are a number of questions that have come in, uh, plus a few that were previously submitted. So, uh, Barry's going to whiz back in here from the UK any second. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought, uh, Bob, I thought I was going to do uh, Jim's. Okay, no problem. Um, so, the first question. Uh, that came in. Um, hang on. Yogesh Patel uh, has a question about cost. Um, I guess we have to decide if it's appropriate to talk about cost first. So, Yogesh, while we work on that, we're going to move on to the next question, which is also about cost. <laughs> and we'll we'll come back and see if we feel like it's okay to do that. Uh, Sounds if good. we decide not to discuss cost, um, you can get the cost questions answered very easily by contacting uh, someone from Flexim. Uh, Eugene, Yogesh has a question of what type of valves are you using for control and isolation? A great, great question. Um, so for the isolation for the block valve, we've moved to a standard of using a um, you know, severe service metal seated ball valve. You know, these are typically two or two or three inch valves. Um, and we, we've been going with the Mogus from, from what we found, those seem to be one of the best um, as far as quality and tight shut off and performance. So that's that's kind of the standard that we've, we've moved to across our fleet now. Okay, thank you. Um, Nicholas uh, Patelli asks, during low load operation, um, was the flexim when the flexim was showing flow? Were the uh, upstream and downstream steam temperatures at the attenuator corresponding to a leak? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I did see that. So not all of our um, units have a, a downstream thermocouple in the spray line, um, but the ones that did, you could clearly see a trend on those. So that was another. Um, option for for monitoring for this, so and, and you could go out there, say like during operations, if that block valve would go shut, you know that the line down, if it had tight shut off, the fluid downstream is going to start to cool off towards ambient because you don't have any process flow going through that line. So you could tell if the valve was leaking by or not, um, but of course that took a lot of efforts to go out in the field and actually measure the pipe temperature. Um, yeah, you can also, you know, look at that through the DCS, the temperature indication. And I, I did see some evidence um, during startups and shutdowns. Um, if you're coming back from a cold startup and you're starting to see some um, temperature increase before the block valve came open, then yeah, that was another another good indication. So certainly could there is some potential there as well for um, monitoring for leak values and temperature indication. Yeah, my experience in doing doing uh, plant surveys and root cause assessments of these failures is 
during early startup and and the latter portions of shutdowns, if you know what to look for, uh, you can see this temperature set difference between inlet to outlet. Uh, but it's it's not a straightforward thing. You could, in some cases, it's not a straightforward thing. You could just set an alarm to, to say we're leaking. And in order to see any temperature spread, the leak has got to be relatively large, much larger than this meter will detect. So um, you're already doing damage by the time you see a leak rate and the temperature spreads. Um, and you're sort of behind the curve, if you will. In some units, depending on piping configuration, uh, it goes the other way. If you've got a, if you've got a temperator or a vertical pipe, you end up at low steam flow seeing the upstream temperature go down because the water falls downward onto that thermocouple. So it's, it's more complicated to do it that way, although it is possible. Um, next question is, will the slide deck be available? Uh, after the meeting, um, Eugene, that's up to you. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't have an issue sharing it. And uh, I think I misinterpreted the last question a little bit. So I was referring to the spray line temperature indicator. I so see. Some some spray lines have a temperature indicator downstream of the block valve, and I know some of our plants do, and some don't. But I think you were actually referring to the pipe thermocouples before and after yeah, the temperature. Uh, I got that's, you. That's right. Right. Yeah, I found it very difficult to use that as an indication for startup and shutdown. It seems like even if the block valve was tight, you would get this thermal stratification because most of our units have three thermocouples, either two or three downstream of the um, a temperator, and you would actually see differences that would look like it would be um, due to leak by but it may be some condensation that was left or you get a little mm -hmm. bit of temperature differences before that unit really heats up. So I found it was very difficult to use those as a good indication. And, and just in my experience. Yeah. 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 It's definitely more complicated. And it, it would almost, it would probably, you, you would need some, some well-trained pattern recognition software if you were going to automate uh, that kind of looking for leaks. Mm -hmm. And now uh, if you're online, and the leak by is really severe. I mean, it's clear. You can see it both before and after. You know, if you're at full load or or part load, and um, and, and you have a significant leak, it's going to show up in the downstream thermocouples. And we had some that were that bad. You could see a ten degree difference. Right. You know. Yeah. All right. We have a, a question from Matt Doyle as to what are the advantages disadvantages of transducer arrangements in line 180 degrees, you know, one on each side of the pipe versus both on the same side of the pipe. Um, Matt, the, the, the reason you do that, um, uh, if you put them on one side of the pipe, that's called one pass, the, the, trans, the uh, signal. There, there's a pair of transducers, by the way, not a single transducer, there's always a pair. So but there's one is sending, the other is receiving, then they alternate and go back the other way. If you put them both on the same side of the pipe so that the signal goes in, bounces off the far wall, comes back, that's one pass, and it gives you a, a some distance of travel through the liquid. If you put one of them on the opposite side of the pipe, and then you get them positioned axially in the right way, you get two passes through the liquid. It goes to the it goes in, bounces off the far wall, comes back, bounces off the near wall, bounces and goes through to the transducer on the far side. That gives you twice the distance of, uh, excuse me, 50% more distance in travel through the fluid. And you can keep doing that to two pass, three pass, four pass. And you, you do that based on uh, the fluid you're measuring, how much uh, signal strength you may need. The more passes it makes, the more accurate it can be. But you've got the issue counterbalancing of attenuation of the signal as it's passing through the fluid. So that can get complicated. Uh, in this case, you can do either based on what's convenient for you because it's not very difficult to shoot it through a pipe full of water uh, like these pipes. This is very, as Eugene said, this is a relatively simple application for this equipment.
and Bob, I know you've um, evaluated using flexums in the past for condensate detection and drain lines. Yeah. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that at all, but it uh, seems like yeah, well, a, there's a another... question here in a minute, sort of relating to that, which we can pick okay. up. Um, uh, Bob Gallette asked, uh, were you able to confirm that pipe damage is reduced by eliminating the block valve leakage? So say, say the question one more time, I'm sorry. It, Bob asked, uh, were you able to confirm that the pipe damage has been reduced by eliminating the leakage? That's a great question. It's still fairly new. So we just installed the permanent installations at HF Lee here in the spring. Um, and so far, you know, all the block valves have been have been um, holding tight. So we just replaced the reheat of temperator block valves in the fall of 2020. And before that, I think it was the the probably the either the spring or the previous um, fall we had replaced the HP. So they're all all fairly new. So really haven't um, got to do a good analysis. We you know we haven't had any failures since we installed them, but like I said, it's still still pretty new okay and, um, and we've had a had a lot of focus on uh, making sure at all of our sites we're going through and replacing these these block valves and you know more focus on making sure that we're maintaining those all right andrew martin asks is there a fluid couplet between the transducer and the pipe if yes how often do you change the coupling Great question. Um, so that they have the permanent um, coupling pads. So they're, they're fairly unique. Um, they're called, I think, flex spring secured mounting fixture guarantees durable contact pressure also on heavily vibrating pipes. And, and that's what we did was these permanent coupling pads. So there's no gel that you have to, to replace. So I see that as being an advantage. And um, I think flex them claims that it's you know a low maintenance uh, solution that you, you don't have to go in and change this out every you know periodically and that's what we did on our system we put the permanent um coupling pads on underneath this perma lock uh, clamping system yeah nor normally um normally andrew we use a uh, a grease a couple of different types of grease for different temperatures that Flexim supplies uh, with the portable installations. That grease has been used in some cases for, for a long, long time uh, without having to do anything to it. But these, uh, these permanent pads are, as Eugene says, are a, uh, a permanent solution, if you will. Um, uh, let's see, Clayton Con. Conslaves asked, he doesn't recall where the flexometer is located, but should this uh, flow meter be installed upstream or downstream of the block valve, Eugene? So we put it upstream of the block valve, and the thought there was the, the pipe would remain full of fluid in that location. And uh, I can't recall yeah. if there was any other reasons, but can you elaborate it, any, Bob, on well, locations. for my experience, well, we, as Eugene said, we've used this this equipment with different signal processing uh, to detect steam versus water in drain pipes and control superheater reheater drains. Um, for the system to to uh, the system is designed to see water. If you get too many bubbles or air or a partially filled pipe, you lose the the transmission of the signal through the fluid and it goes into a fault condition. So to prevent that from occurring, putting it upstream of the block valve in this case is the best solution because that pipe will stay full. As Eugene said, if you put it downstream and your control valve leaked, now you're gonna have a, a, a mixture or an empty pipe in the, uh, and the meter's gonna go into default. It'll reset itself when the water comes back, but it's, it's, uh, it may not be as accurate as it would be on the upstream side for this application. Robert Threlkeld asks, what kind of training are you doing for the operators at the plant on this system? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, we put together a, a brief package, just PowerPoint 
um, just to send out and just discuss the, the technology and some of the differences between that and the, and the flow transmitters. Uh, so that, and then of course we have the OEM manual, which is, which is easy to read and pretty straightforward. Um, and it talks about how to, to navigate through the, the flow transmitter itself and to set it up and, and to go to different um, screens and settings and, and things like that. So of course they, they have that as well. They need to reference it, but yeah, the main thing was to kind of talk about the technology and how it works so they could get a good understanding of the, the equipment in their plant. And, um, you know, our original DP transmitter put out a reading in KPPH. So we wanted to keep that consistent with the ultrasonics. You can choose any, any type of, um, volumetric or mass flow rate to display, you know, it's got different options and, you know, we wanted to keep that, that consistent. So it is putting out a mass flow rate because you can, you could do feet per second or meters per second, all kinds of different um, units and, and, and different ways to display the data. Okay. Let me explain. Normally we unmute the people asking the questions and let them ask them. Um, but since that takes longer and we're, running up against the clock with lots of questions i'm gonna i'll keep reading them uh clayton consgrave conslaves asks did you consider a comparison against using condensate detection with temperature elements in a downstream uh superheater drain pot um that that's really not a viable option uh when the unit's running there won't be any water in that down and if there is a downstream drain pot uh, there better not be any water in it. Uh, any leakage that occurs is picked up by the steam when the unit's operating. At uh, at low steam flows or during hot layup, if water leaks in, it's already damaged the, the temperator liner and the pipe before it ever gets to that drain pot. So that's really not a viable uh, means. Um, Jeff Cummings asked, did you consider installing a second actuated block valve in series to help prevent leakage? So we, we had um, discussed doing that, um, but decided not to take that approach, just given the, the high amount of cost. You, you're having to install a second block valve. You're talking about maybe a block and bleed type of configuration. That yeah. certainly would be a good option to provide, provide that you know, positive isolation um, and guarantee you're not going to leak by your block valve. So, you know, we did consider that, but that's not the approach we decided to take just due to the, due to the cost, um, the complexity of having to add the additional logic and programming and then having to run a, you know, a drain line um, for the, for the bleed portion of that. So, we, yeah, just something we didn't uh, decide to move forward with. And we thought this flexible yeah. approach would be good. I agree with with what uh, Duke has decided. Um, the, I generally recommend this tandem block valve for situations where the piping configuration on an older unit is such that any leakage is going to run directly into a superheater or reheater coil, where we know it's going to do severe damage. Um, so this the double block valve, tandem block valve, and bleed arrangement can protect you in that severe situation. Um, this, this flow meter solution to monitoring is, is less expensive than adding that block valve and bleed. Uh, so I think, I think Duke has made a good choice in going this way. Uh, as long as they follow through and use the information coming from this monitoring to then implement maintenance at the right time, this should work out very well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Clayton has another, we have just a couple of minutes left. Clayton uh, has another question. Is spray water control valve supposed to close when the block valve closes? Uh, and would that prevent spray water from reaching the nozzles? Yeah, good question. So what the way we've programmed our spray water uh, block valve and control valve is a master martyr. Since we want to protect the block valve for good tight shutoff, we will close the TCV first to take the pressure drop and then open it last um, so that you know disadvantage is that is you're going to wear out your tcv and you may have to replace the the trim a little sooner 
Um, but you know what we found is is these TCVs are not they don't have the class the high class rated shut off and they're not good for um, you know complete isolation. So a lot of times you'll see these TCVs just start to wear out much quicker and and um, they, they're not you know they're going to leak by and and that's pretty common to see the TCV leaking water by. I, I agree with my experience says that you should never trust the control valve to be leak tight. I don't care how much you pay for it, but the manufacturer tells you the class five shutoff or whatever, it will not remain tight no matter how you treat it. So yes, if the, if the block valve leaks, the water's gonna end up in the, in the piping. Uh, Dennis Funk from Flexon has, has commented that the permanent coupling pad that, that uh, Eugene met reference is not subject to replacement. So it is a permanent installation. Uh, Jeff Cummings asks, for a brand new HRSG installation, would you specify an ultrasonic flow meter in lieu of an orifice? Is there any reason to keep the orifice if you did that? Yep, you know, um, you know, I had mentioned there were some of our sites that only have one channel. Um, so we are moving forward with replacing the, the DP transmitter with the flex. I mean, we have that much confidence in the accuracy and the uh, you know, reliability of it in, in long term. So I, we haven't made that decision or had any internal discussions uh, with as far as new plant specifications. But I mean, right now I would be confident to make that change, um, just given the benefits of the you know low flow accuracy and, and what it does. So, you know, yeah, I would agree that I think we could make that change going forward with new plant specifications. Okay. Um, and with one minute left, one final comment. Dennis Funk uh, with Flexim says that he would be glad to answer any additional questions, um, including the cost questions that we haven't, haven't gotten to. Uh, Dennis's email is dfunk at flexim.de. That's D F U N K at flexm.de. All right, it's 12 o'clock and we have made a perfect landing on the one hour, Eugene. 